Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. The historical representations of women throughout history as witches is vast and well documented. The ways that the witch trope took hold as a gender stereotype is tied to complicated social, religious, political, and cultural considerations throughout history. Today in 2020, I enjoy talking about modern day witch practices with modern witches because it is very interesting, but I'm also interested in talking about the history of witches, witchcraft, magic, and gender tropes. This episode featuring Dr. Julia Gossard discusses how women are represented as witches throughout different periods and contexts, specifically ancient Egypt, the Roman Empire, the medieval period, and in the most detail, the witchcraft craze of the early modern period. We compare and contrast the ways witchcraft was categorized as good, such as healing or alchemy, and bad, such as using potions or poisons with the intention of causing harm. We discuss good and bad magic recipes and the well-known Malleus Maleficarum. Julia M. Gossard is Assistant Professor of History at Utah State University. There she specializes in early modern European and Atlantic history with an emphasis on gender, family, and childhood. She is the author of her first book, Coercing Children, State Building and Social Reform in the Early Modern French World, which is under contract with McGill Queens University Press. You can find her online at juliamgossard.com or on Twitter at jmgossard. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation on the history of witchcraft representation with Dr. Julia Gossard. Dr. Julia Gossard, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thank you so much for having me. It is a delight to have you here. And can you just take a moment to introduce yourself however you see fit? Sure. I am Julia Gossard. I am an assistant professor at Utah State University. Um, my research is primarily on the history of childhood and youth in early modern Europe, especially France. But I teach a wide variety of courses here at USU on European history. Um, everything from modern Western civilization to something more specialized like the history of witchcraft and women in a course cheekily titled Witches, Workers, and Wives. Mm, love it. Um, so I'm curious about people's backstories whenever I'm getting to know a guest for the first time uh, about your, your professional trajectory. How did you decide to get into history as a profession and that led you to become a historian? What was that story like? I think I had always inherently been interested in history. I remember very distinctly, um, we moved a lot growing up. We moved about every two years. And so every time we moved, um, I was very interested in going to whatever historical site was there. So I remember I begged my parents when we lived in Greenville, North Carolina, to take me to the New Bern Palace, Mm. like almost every weekend. And I was fascinated with it. And then when we moved to Illinois, just a few years later, I always wanted to go to Springfield and look at the log cabins that they had there and the history of Lincoln and everything. And even when we moved to Texas, I had that similar fascination. I wasn't really sure that I wanted history, though, to be my career until I was a sophomore in college. I really thought I wanted to go into marketing. And then I got the opportunity to study abroad for a year in Paris, France. And with my mentors there, seeing what, you know, research was involved, what history was involved, um, I really just fell in love with the process of doing research and teaching. And I had some fabulous mentors at Southern Methodist University, like Kathleen William, uh, Wellman and Alan Gahan, who really just helped guide me. And I, I fell in love with that aspect of it. I absolutely love how a trip abroad can change everything, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And uh, for about seven years, I was actually the assistant director and program assistant for uh, a study abroad program in Paris. And that Mm. was a really great gig to have during graduate school to be able to do research and and help students discover Paris for the first time, you know, through new eyes, which is really great. Unbelievable. Whenever I go to a new place, I tend to like try to find out what famous historical figures are buried there. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
that's one of my favorite things ever. Like I live in Buffalo and President Millard Fillmore is buried here. The funk musician Rick James is buried here. So I'm always looking for like where people are buried. And I sort of like go on like tours of death whenever I visit new places. <laughs> it's definitely a, a different way to, to look at it. But it yeah, yeah, yeah. Nevertheless. Um, so that's kind of on 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 uh, on brand for what we're going to talk about here today. We're going to talk a little bit about a specific area of your teaching, and that is the historical representation of women throughout history and the ways that the witch trope took hold as a gender stereotype. And there's a lot of factors that go into this, such as social, religious, political, cultural. And I enjoy talking to people who practice witchcraft and call themselves witches today and i'm really excited to dive into some of the history behind that as well but there's a term that i just dropped and that is the word trope and i have some younger listeners for whom that may be a new term so i'm wondering if you can describe what a trope is and why something like that matters when studying history sure you know a kind of a technical definition of of trope would be you know, a word or expression used in a figurative sense, right? So if we're talking about, you know, cliches used in horror movie tropes, so these kind of repeated actions that we see, a witch in many ways is not one solid definition. There are a lot of um, factors that go into this and characteristics that we use to associate with a witch. So in many ways, it's like a stereotype of different types of behaviors, So when I present, you know, witches, workers, and wives, these are really the three tropes that we most commonly associate with women, whether that's in popular culture, whether that's through religious angle or an economic angle for early modern Europe, that we can start to see some similarities in how society constructs their understandings of women during this period. Mm, Okay, great. And you know, what's really interesting about that is whenever I think of like witches specifically, you think of like the, the words like hag or crone, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Are those like common terms that you hear whenever you're like reading about these topics on your side in the profession? Definitely. And, and I think, you know, outsider is another one there for sure, or suspicious in many Mm. ways. And so it's sort of these characteristics that we begin to associate that fill in this sort of figurative idea. Excellent. Okay. So I, I know that you have given some public talks on this topic and you describe the views and representations of witches throughout the ages. And I noticed that in some of your work, you've talked about ancient Egypt, the Roman Empire, the medieval period, and the early modern period. How does the representation of witches in all these different contexts change in general throughout these different periods and, and places? I think the most important thing to recognize is that there has always been some sort of witch or occult practices in many ways too um, that have existed throughout history. So it's the early modern period we like to think of as being the quote unquote witchcraft craze, which we can talk about later. But throughout all of these different eras, we have examples of individuals engaged in what we might think of as witchcraft. So in ancient Egypt, you have you know, what we might call witch doctors or kind of folklorists who are practicing, you know, worship to particular gods, doing sort of medicine or this belief too that those individuals could gain power from the gods through shape shifting or through amulets that they're given. So this way in which they're imbued with a sense of power from a deity um, and possibly involved in some sort of healing practices or very nefarious practices as well. And that kind of gets transferred on even in in Roman mythology. And Roman mythology, I think, is really where we start to see some of the more evil sides of witchcraft and a very heavy association of witchcraft with women. Whereas in ancient Egypt, we often think of some of those practitioners as being more male. Um, In Roman mythology, they're usually women, and they're usually women who are eating children. Mm. Um, that kind of becomes one of the most common uh, views is that these are women who are out to eat children. When you think about that, that's really kind of pushing one of society's greatest fears, right? Yeah. That children are, are the most, um, you know, vulnerable of the populations that the most evil thing you could do would be to eat them. And we see too, you know, that's one of the first times we see witches being burnt at the stake. 
um, and as we go on through the medieval period, this is where we start to have many more representations of kind of a stock witch character and what we might think of as, as a witch in our own society. So a witch flying on a broom, um, the fact that she might have what we call a familiar, which is usually like a little animal that was a demon that would follow her around. So, you know, many of the listeners might be familiar with, say, Sabrina, the teenage witch. And or, cat, yeah, say. or the, uh, his dark materials, right? Yeah, exactly. So you have, you have this, this representation of a demon that is in some sort of an animal that gives her power in that way. So we start to see much more of that. And by the early modern era, some of these ideas have solidified and there starts to be this societal really craze around trying to root out who is a witch or trying to explain the unexplained by saying, oh, this must be the result of the devil. There must be a witch in our presence. Mm, Okay. So from what I'm gathering, it seems like the ancient Egyptian depictions are more positive in nature like this doesn't seem like they're viewed as being evil creatures right i think that there's i think there could be right that's not my biggest area of specialization but my understanding is is that it's much more associated with with medicine and that idea or healing or religious representation although there there could be some negative aspects of that as well but as time goes on it becomes much more heavily associated with sort of demonic possession and demonic ideas, which would be much more negative. Okay, great. So um, I want to focus on the early modern period for a bit. Sure. That's the one that's most close to us as far as like our own society now. It might be some things that are recognizable within the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you look at societies and cities from this period of history and like it looks somewhat recognizable to us, like houses and churches and roads and cities. I like to say it's almost like a blueprint for our modern times. You see the very foundations of society starting to crystallize, but it's not quite there yet. Okay. What specific years are we talking about whenever we say early modern? Because delineating periods of history, um, you know, not everybody has a grasp on on that sure. specifically. And this is actually something that, you know, if you talk to any early modernist or a medievalist or a modernist, you're going to get something slightly different. It's something we love to quibble over a little bit is, is the periodization here. For me, I'm looking at the early modern as really anything from about 1450, so the Renaissance starting in Europe, through about 1800. You might be able to push that a little bit farther into the 19th century, but really the 19th century is our end. After the age of revolutions, um, we can really say that the modern era is starting to develop much more clearly than the early modern era. Okay, great. So... um... As somebody who studies the lives of women in a lot of different ways, I'm curious if you can just describe what the life of like an ordinary early modern woman in Europe would be like, and then like later in the Americas. So like, what is like a normal, boring life like in this period? Sure. Um, you know, I think that you have, what's really important to recognize is that this entire era is full of change right? You're going through some of the largest changes that you see of in religion. We have the Protestant Reformation that happens, and then the ensuing Counter-Reformation. And religion is a big part of people's lives. It's not only a ritual practice, it's also how they view their life, right? And how they explain everything is through biblical terms. So you actually have quite a bit of religious turmoil that is happening in people's lives, not only from a personal faith standpoint, but we also fight wars of religion, especially in France, Mm. or, you know, most of the 16th century over issues of Protestantism. So we have to kind of keep in mind religion as a big part of people's lives. Um, But normal people would probably find themselves either in an agrarian society, on a farm, you know, toiling the land um, as their ancestors before them had. There's starting to be an emergence of a capitalist economy over the course of the early modern period. So you're slowly seeing people move from sort of subsistence farming and just getting by towards making profits and moving towards um, city centers. And so we're seeing the rise of urbanization and towns like London and Paris are going to double and even triple in population Mm. over this time period. And with that too, if you're somebody who's moving from a primarily agrarian area into a city center like London or Paris, that's going to come with a whole set of new social circumstances, creating new senses of community, um, 
suspicion as well as friendship and relationships. Uh, you know, it, it was probably not the most entertaining of lives in our, in our perception of what entertaining would be, but there are a lot more outlets for people too. Um, you also have a consumer revolution starting to happen where you have people buying more goods and being able to express themselves much more clearly through those goods, especially through fashion and dress. And I think that we also see the role of women because we have these changes happening in the economy you have many more women taking on responsibility um, of in the economy itself, not only for their families, but for themselves of going out and working in these sort of factory type situations where they're earning a wage and they're being able to socialize and have leisure practices like they never had before. Excellent. So whenever there's like uh, this massive religious change, does mm -hmm. that cause any sort of turmoil in the society? Like are people kind of like becoming more suspicious of each other or worried or anything like that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that is one of the reasons why there is such this emphasis on, on witchcraft um, suspicion in this period is that with this religious change, number one, your population is having to learn new practices and why the practices that they had been doing are no longer accepted. Mm. I, I, one of the, the greatest primary sources from this era in terms of religion that I can think of is the records from the Geneva consistory in the 16th century. And Geneva became you know, more or less a, a theocracy in the 16th century with their change over um, to Protestantism. And the consistory would bring in people who were accused of not following the new religious practices. So, and they, you know, papists in that way. So people who continued to act in, in Catholic manners. And it was this way of not just necessarily punishment, but of re-education. And there's this great example from a young man who they say, you know, you keep saying the prayers in Latin and we're not supposed to do that anymore. He says, yeah, I, I, I learned the prayers in Latin as a young guy. See, the problem is, is that I have a really thick skull. My skull is so thick. I actually just can't understand or memorize the new words. This happens to me all the time. And I thought that was just so funny, the ways in which, you know, people were going through these processes <laughs> and just saying, oh, it's been a ritual my whole life. I just, I, I, my, my school is so thick. I can't, I can't possibly learn something. <laughs> nice. So earlier you said that the, uh, an interesting phrase, witchcraft craze, mm -hmm. and you've described the early modern period as, as a witchcraft craze. Mm -hmm. Um, so what locations in the world did you, would you say had this craze against witchcraft? Like what are like the epicenters of this struggle? Sure. And this is something that, that many witchcraft specialists use about the early modern period is that there does seem to be a spike in witchcraft accusations and cases taking place um, really from about uh, 1550 to about 1650. And we see this happening across most of Europe, um, as well as British North American colonies too where this is happening. So you see this kind of in, in what, what some might label to be Western society at that point in time. And it really varies according to, to different regions. Um, in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, which is sort of the Germanic, Germanic principalities during this time, that's probably the highest place that you're going to be seeing this. And we have to remember that's also a place where Lutheran, Lutheranism and Protestantism are really taking off especially from 1550 to 1650. So you see a lot of religious tensions in these areas. And then we have an explosion of witchcraft accusations in these areas as well. Okay, great. So um, in this period, uh, I'd imagine that there's different like levels of acceptability whenever it comes to doing certain things. So, like something might be seen as good, like healing somebody but something might be seen as bad, which would be like mm -hmm. the intention of causing harm. Is there like a spectrum of what is acceptable within these time periods and what is not acceptable? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Greg, because there is this, this understanding that in order to be considered witchcraft, and in, in, there, there's actually a number of manuals that are published over the early modern period for witchcraft, 
um, priests and jurors to understand how to prosecute witchcraft accusations, what to look out for, for potential witches, um, you know, what is the sort of evidence that you would need there. And in almost all instances, it has to be an example of what we would call maleficium, mm. which would be an act of witchcraft performed with the intention of causing damage or injury. So that's really the key there is that it would have to be something with the intention of causing harm. Mm. Um, as time goes on too, it's usually this understanding that you cause that harm through a spell or a potion or something else that was given to you by the devil or a demon. And so we see the religious aspects worked in there too, that this isn't something that just somebody is intending to do harm. They're intending to do harm imbued with quite a bit of power from the devil. And okay. I think, yeah. And I, I going to this idea too about good versus bad. I think this is an important, um, whenever I teach this to students, they're always going, okay, I, I kind of understand what maleficium is. Mm -hmm. Right. But good magic seems also problematic. Mm, yes, absolutely. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. And good magic in this way would be kind of considered again, more on that idea of healing. There were lots of women in this period, especially midwives and apothecaries who use herbal medicines and different tonics and things like that to provide healing to women. In particular, um, when we think about good or acceptable magic, sometimes it's usually in reference to like reproductive issues. So, you know, you had a number of women who would make teas for each other in cases that they had um, their, their menstruation had stopped. And so this would restart menstruation in many ways. And that, that goes to our different understandings of pregnancy and conception mm. and sexuality during this period. And so what we might think of as healers would be accepted because they are just using different, you know, long-term folklore remedies and herbal remedies to help people out. Although they will slowly start to be looked at with more and more suspicion as people become a little bit more paranoid about which is being present in society. Yeah, I mean, I'd imagine that's a very fine line and you could be seen as a healer, but then one wrong move and then bam, you're accused of being the bad one. Yeah, and there's what's, what's absolutely fascinating about France in particular is that we have the witchcraft craze happening where you have lots of accusations of women being witches. And alongside that, you have something known that's happening in the French um, royal court and nobility as the affair of the poisons, which is an equal underlying worry from Louis XIV and members of his nobility that certain people were seeking out um, these healers in terms of um, you know, different potions that might give them benefits like love potions, or they would be able to paralyze their political opponents in this way. So you had kind of this, um, this trade in dark magic and, and potions during this era that become a little bit conflated between the two. Interesting. Okay. So what I'm curious about now is, do you have like, uh, do you know any specific like recipes for like a good a uh, magic healing potion like do you do you know what like the ingredients were of something in particular yeah so i have actually i have two examples i can give you an example of good magic and i can give you an example of bad magic fantastic right so for good magic i have an example um that's taken from uh a book uh which is to neighbors where it is a recipe for tea to restart menstruation from 1616. So this would have been created possibly by a midwife or a healer. Um, and it would be 17 drops of castor oil, eight or more fresh evening primrose petals, a handful of ground blue cohosh, a sprinkle of powdered lead and pine roots. Mm. So you would, you would basically brew that up together and then the woman would ingest it. What we know now is, is that pregnant women should never take castor oil or <laughs> cohosh or lead. <laughs> you know, actually, non-pregnant women should also not take those things. Yeah, probably not. 
Um, so it, it's interesting, though, to see the ways in which restarting a missed period was acceptable because the early modern society didn't really think of um, pregnancy starting until they could feel a baby quicken. That's when mm. they believed the soul went into a baby's body. Um, so, you know, that usually doesn't happen until about three or four months. Yeah. So essentially, even though this was considered good, it might be controversial in our society today because more or less what they've created is is something that would induce a miscarriage. Yeah. Right? Um, but this was considered acceptable in the early modern period. And it's wow. drawing from primarily natural resources, right? Um, so that was kind of considered good magic. Now, I should preface this here because I can already feel some early modern saying, well, there were laws about this. And yes, you couldn't necessarily sell this in the open, right? You couldn't necessarily have your stall necessarily and, and be selling these sorts of things. But it was a well-accepted practice that wasn't heavily regulated, right? Of, what's of the, like, what's the law then? Um, they really, you know, they had a variety of different laws where you couldn't um, sell potions and spells and things like that that were happening um, in, in the 16th and 17th centuries. They're, they're different for every single region. That's gotcha. Okay. Tell me the bad one now. I'm really curious about this because I so, have a foreboding sense. <laughs> so this is coming from the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, um, one of their manuscript sources during the Affair of the Poisons when they are interviewing um, this very um, well-known she considers herself to be a healer, but she practices much more of this nefarious type of magic. Her, her favorite type of magic are love potions and paralytics that you could give to your political or social rivals. Oh my. And so this is a potion for the obsessive and undying love of a suitor. One heart of a newborn baby, one spleen from a prostitute dried and ground into a fine paste, one jug of blood from a new mother, one dried umbilical cord, spit from a witch's mouth, a lock of hair from a baby's mother taken as she exhales her last breath and an eyeball from a dog. Okay, so that's a very different tone compared to the ingredients of the first recipe. Absolutely. You can, you can sense the maleficium in yeah. this one. Um, you can sense the fact that, number one, you're going to have to do a lot of harm to get yeah. all of these ingredients. And you can tell that this is not going to be used for a good purpose. And yeah, the spleen alone and the, the baby heart. I mean, <laughs> yes. terrifying. Terrifying. And, and you get a sense of sort of chills drop down your spine when you hear that. And the recipe actually goes on to say the potion, potion must be brewed for 37 hours placed in a chalice under the full moon to ask the most evil father of the underworld himself to bless it. And that's where we have that key part of the devil has to come and bless it himself. Mm. Wow. Okay. Um, that is really intriguing. And then if something like this wouldn't work, it would be really easy to say, well, I didn't let it brew long enough. You know, like I didn't hit that magic number of like a specific number of hours. So there's always right. a way to like justify it if it doesn't actually produce the magical end result, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There, or, you know, the devil didn't think that it was worth his time to come and give you the, the blessing here. Mm, right? Okay. And I mean, I do have my doubts about you know, is somebody actually going out and getting the heart of a newborn baby or is this just rhetoric that they're using at this point in time? I mean, it would definitely terrify a, uh, a local population, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And I think that's probably a lot to do with it is, um, you know, casting suspicion upon a certain person who is vulnerable in a society saying they're going to steal your baby's heart. Exactly. It's like, what is the most sensationalized thing that we could say about these women in society that would get us to all rally around the idea that she might be a witch? Mm, okay. So what I'm curious about now is like, what groups of people in a society, so like picture like a normal town in the middle of like early modern Europe or British colonies in North America. What are the groups of people who are like leading this craze against these so-called witches? I think that there's, there's a number of things, you know, I think that this starts out, there's, there's no doubt that this starts out as an offshoot of the inquisition, right. Of both the Italian and the Spanish inquisition of looking for heretics in the community, 
the sense that the Catholic Church has to root out heretics in order to make sure that Catholic practices are continuing and they're continuing in the vein that they want it to continue. Um, and then political society as well, looking towards are there members of society that are threatening our social stability? Um, you know, is everybody keeping with the status quo? Are there not? But these ideas of, of magic and of witchcraft really do take hold with just normal community members as well. And that's what I find so interesting is that it's not necessarily that they're in every single community. There are some communities that are like this, that these accusations are coming from the top to the bottom. Instead, it seems like community members are actually complaining about their neighbors in particular. Mm. And when we kind of pull back the layers, it looks like something I alluded to earlier, which is you know, a particular area might be experiencing excessive famines, right? Or some sort of a fungal infection in the wheat, right? That is making them have a very, very low crop yield that year. And without really the tools to fully explain, oh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's fungus on your wheat that's happening here, or, you know, this is a famine, it's a cyclical issue that you're going to face, or disease and pandemics that are happening in the early modern world that they can't quite figure out how and why they're spreading, they're going to look for a scapegoat. Mm. And so for many, when they're trying to explain something bad that has happened in their home or in their community, they might be looking through that religious lens again and saying, well, this is evidence that the devil is doing something. And perhaps because they also maybe are feeling societal pressures. Maybe there is a neighbor who they're having a dispute with over land boundaries. That's something that you see happen in the Salem witch trials, for instance, in Massachusetts, you have issues over land boundaries. Maybe that's going to become then compounded. And instead of thinking, well, this is the devil, they're going to start thinking, well, this is the, an example that, you know, my neighbor, Mary, she must be a witch because I saw her looking at my cow and the next day my cow dropped dead. Mm. And it's really easy to like make people turn against each other in these instances. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's even what we call today, you know, witchcraft, you know, witchcraft craze or, or witch hunt, right? Mm. It becomes this sense of social paranoia in a way too, that people can put their blames and frustrations on vulnerable members of the society or look for something that's not quite there. Okay. So say we have a woman in a town who is being blamed for famines or dead animals or what mm -hmm. have you. Um, what does this witch craze look like? What are the people in these towns and cities doing against these women who get this stigma of being a witch? Sure. I actually think it might be helpful to, to just say what some of, you know, there, there are going to be differences in every region and in every case, but sort of some of the typicalities that we can look at for a witch herself would be that this is usually an unmarried or a widowed woman, usually in her, her 40s, so in, in their terms, later age. Mm -hmm. um, she would probably be of lower economic standing and probably have some sort of a reputation as being an outsider or being difficult in many ways, maybe she is quarrelsome or she has a number of problems with families in the town, maybe especially families who have had a lot of political clout. Um, and often too, she might be somebody who has lots of animals that she keeps around, maybe unusual animals that she keeps around. Um, and somebody who just seems like they're not going with the flow. They are somebody mm. who pushes back against society's constraints a little bit here, um, you know, a lot of times women who are night owls would be accused of, of doing something bad and being a witch in this way. I'm and, curious. Yeah, oh, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. You can go ahead. I was just going to say the, the way that, that people would bring their complaints, and this is something that's so interesting about the early modern period, is we do see people starting to use the legal system as an apparatus for themselves. So people knew how to go and file a complaint at their local courthouse. And this is what they would do. Usually there's going to start to be gossip that happens around this individual, right? You know, oh, I, I have a, a, there's a great case um, of Eunice Cole, who is a woman in Britain who um, 
or England during this time, who is accused of being a witch four times in her community. So four separate witchcraft cases are brought against her, which, and, and the community has kind of routinely turned against her because she is just very unpleasant to be around. They say she's totally quarrelsome. She's not friendly. She's not nice, which also goes to some gendered stereotypes, right? The idea that women should always be nice. Mm. They should always be amenable. Um, she's unmarried. And almost everybody starts having their own examples of like what they've seen Eunice Cole do that is strange. You know, one of them saw her lick a bar of soap and then turn into a frog, <laughs> you know, and one said, oh, she came over and then my daughter was ill with essentially what would have been a flu for two weeks. Um, and so it also becomes, I think, a little bit of a community bonding experience for those who are accusing the witch of doing these practices. Um, sort of like, oh, yeah, I too had this experience. You want to be part of something, especially as this becomes a more and more public process where people start coming into the witchcraft cases. There's lots of testimony given. It's in some ways an entertainment aspect as well. Mm. And I bet they felt pretty good about themselves too, like using the bureaucratic process of like f official paperwork and like all these things. Like I bet they felt like, oh, at least we're doing it legitimately and we're not just like stringing people up, right? Absolutely. And that, that becomes a big part of, of the early modern era is this idea that, um, you know, as people start to use the bureaucracy more and more, the state loves that, right? Early modern states, as they're solidifying power, the more that they can get people to use their bureaucracies, the better. So witchcraft cases are actually strengthening the power of the state because they're having people see how powerful it is to get to use a court system. Mm. Okay. What I'm curious about now is how, uh, so we talked about like the isolated women, the uh, like women in their forties who are like childless or single or argumentative. How does sexuality play into this as well? Is there like a, um, like a, a way that, that a woman who might be like perceived as being like promiscuous in some way uh, and against like the, you know, the very different styles of, um, life that, you know, we're, un we're not really thinking about today, but like, I'd imagine that that was a huge part of the discussion too, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the biggest differences we have to recognize when we're talking about gendered stereotypes and sexualized stereotypes in the early modern period is it's a little bit inverted from what we have today. While I think modern society tends to view men as being the one who are perhaps more obsessed with, with sex and, and, you know, sexuality. Instead, in the early modern period, it was actually older women who were the most suspect of being perhaps sexually licentious, hmm. and the idea, especially widows. And the idea was there that they had had a taste of forbidden fruit, and when their husband died, they no longer had an outlet, right? So they were kind of sex crazed. And this goes back also to scientific understandings of the time as women being controlled by their wombs, um, not having the same control that men did over their bodies. So these women are already, if they're widows, somewhat su sexually suspect, mm. um, where they are already being accused of, well, they aren't married. You know, they've had this taste of forbidden fruit. Are they out there having multiple relationships with people? So that becomes a big part of it. But also in popular consciousness, there's this added idea, and this may be shocking for some of the younger viewers, um, mm. that which is in order to make a pact with the devil, they had to become the devil's essentially bride, which means they had to have sex with the devil. Mm. They had to consummate a relationship there. Um, and within sort of a religious explanation, that's given that women were sort of the more quote unquote carnal of the two sexes. So of course they would be willing to have sex with the devil and enter into a relationship with him. That was just within their nature. Mm. This kind of goes back to an explanation of, of Adam and Eve and original sin and all of that. Interesting. Okay, so uh, society obviously fights back sort of like against these women. But like when I say fight back, I mean obviously like attack these women yeah. relentlessly. Yes. Um, and so they're fighting back against what they perceive to be a massive threat to normal order in their world. And yeah. um, a term that springs to mind uh, from my review of this, there's a term that's like, I, I think it's malleus maleficarum. Okay. Yeah. Malleus maleficarum. 
Okay, so is that what is this? I've heard it's like the uh, translated as like hammer of the witches. Like, how does this play into uh, what society is doing to sort of like fight back against these women? So this is the Malleus Maleficarum is a more or less a guide written by two Catholic inquisitors um, in in the 16th century, where they it actually might be the 15th century, 15th or 16th century where they are combining and consolidating all of the existing thought that exists on witchcraft. What does each region think a witch looks like? How can you, as either a Catholic inquisitor in your community, as a a priest or as a state member, how can you root out witchcraft in your area to potentially cause your area less harm? So, they're kind of going over all of the different ways. Okay. Is the woman single? Is she older? What has happened here? And this is also where they really solidify the role of the demon where they say in very plain terms, this, the witch is an example of demonic possession and the devil being present in society. And it is our duty as good Catholics to rid the world of, of demonic possession and demonic presence. Um, and it really also solidifies the idea of women at witches. And this is where we get that idea of, of women being the more carnal, therefore they'll enter into relationships with the devil. They're kind of laying it out in a guide here. Mm. So earlier I mentioned the social, religious, political, and cultural factors, and you're kind of honed in right now on like the religious factors mm-hmm. and considerations. And I'm curious what was being said, like in in church, like at mass, um, sure. to get the people of like a town on board with this kind of stuff being described in the Malleus Maleficarum and however else they were, you know, approaching this. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be in the masses warnings about devils, especially when there comes to be um, a witchcraft case in a particular town. I mean, I think that anybody interested in the Salem witchcraft trials can go and look at some of the sermons that are being given about the fact that the devil is actually in their town and they must root it out and it's very fire and brimstone and it's serving as as intense warnings. Um, But I don't think that church is the only place where they're getting this. They're also getting this in the witchcraft trials themselves when testimonies are coming out from supposed experts about something called the witch's Sabbath. Mm, Um, What is that? So this was an idea that all of the witches in a particular region would get together on, you know, a particular night, usually the Sabbath, where they would have more or less a celebration, an amatory mass to the devil. And more or less, this is inverted Catholicism. So they would say the mass backwards to invoke the devil Um, The devil kind of sits as their deity. There was a praise of sexuality happening. So instead of restricting one's sexuality and being very pure and pious, this is about having sex in the open, um, celebrating uh, usually very evil things, having devils be present and all the witches coming together. This usually happened under like the cloak of night, right? Or that's what they said. Mm. Um, And so it's showing that witchcraft at least from the perception of, of quote unquote experts, that women were had these supernatural powers and that they were in clear uh, conflict with traditional religious practices, that this was devil worship in many ways. And the devil was rewarding his congregants with this power. So it also showed that, so, you know, these, these jurors and surveyors who are going through and accusing those of witchcraft would say, this is what happened. And actually some women, because they, this had trickled down to popular consciousness, who are accused of witchcraft actually admit to this in many ways. They say, yeah, I did fly off to the witch's Sabbath at night and I did do this. Now, hmm. whether or not those meetings actually occurred by women who believed that they were witches, that's hard for us to be able to kind of pinpoint down But it might also have been a way that the woman herself is having this moment on the stand of having a lot of attention where she hadn't before, where she feels powerful and she's almost playing a role in that way. Are any of these um, behaviors like the the inverted Catholicism you mentioned in the Witch's Sabbath, are any of these things like practiced today in any forms of like modern witch practice or anything like that? 
To, to my knowledge, I'm not entirely certain. I mean, I think that there are certain, you know, religions where you have and religious practices where you do have an inversion of, of Catholic or Christian processes where it is more of Satan worship. And that's, that's part of an organized religion in that capacity. My understanding is that the majority of, of witchcraft today is kind of more on like Wiccan tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Of sort of the healing aspects of nature, the divine, you know, divinity of nature in that capacity. I don't know though, for certain. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause now we think about witchcraft, like in very different ways today, um, mm -hmm. witchcraft is like largely not feared within people who are dedicated to living in like thriving in modern secular societies yeah. in the United States. It's like protected under the, you know, freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. And it's much more like live and let live. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, don't bother me. I won't bother you. You practice what you want to practice. I'll practice what I want to practice. And we all get on with it. How does this contrast with like the early modern period? Like how much did leaders of that time period take this topic seriously? Like were they like actually like really, really afraid? Yes. Okay. They were definitely afraid of this. This was a serious threat to them. I think it's often hard for us as 21st century citizens who do live in this society where freedom of religion and exists. And there is quite a bit of, we understand the secular world, right? we understand that there can be a separation between the two. They didn't in the early modern period, right? Everything is through very strongly religious lenses. Even politics or even science is through a very strong religious lens. So they're taking this threat of the devil as being extremely serious. And as I mentioned, this is a time of intense change. So when you're feeling change around you and you can't quite explain it, that's going to cause you to try to explain it in any way you can. And it's probably going to be through a religious angle and it's probably going to be the devil. Mm. Okay. So um, I was reading some of your work and like, I get the impression that like the year 1700 is significant in some way. Why is 1700 important? So 1700 itself is, is not important at all. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a nice round number that historians of witchcraft use as an example for the majority of Europe. Now, there are some examples where, especially like in Scotland and other areas where witchcraft continues on into the 18th century. Um, but for the majority of early modern society, the witchcraft craze seems to spike between 1550 and 1650 and then almost tapers off and is almost non-existent by 1700. And there are a couple of different um, theories as to why. The first theory is that, you know, for, for our listeners who know a little bit about early modern Europe, this coincides with the rise of the scientific revolution mm. with, you know, the new processes of, of gaining knowledge through science, finding out a little bit more about the natural world, um, and realizing that some of the things that they had blamed witches for maybe wasn't witches' faults. It was just climate change, or it was a famine, or it was disease, having a bigger understanding and skepticism towards solely religious explanations for things and looking more towards the secular. And that starts to take over educated society a little bit. And educated society, I think, starts to push back against uneducated society or less educated society says mm, there might be more of an explanation than we're willing to admit here. So is there any way that any examples you can offer of how like witches were blamed for like big pandemics, like, uh, you know, like the plague or whatever, like famous things like were, were witches blamed for like large pandemics as well? I think in, in smaller communities they are. I mean, I don't think that they're to my knowledge, there's not somebody saying like the black plague ran through here again, therefore it's the witch. Mm. But I think in, in smaller communities where they might be plagued by different types of disease, definitely that could be, you know, a witch, especially if there were other social issues going in on the time that that woman would have been suspect yeah. for a variety of other issues. So it kind of served as, as a good scapegoat. And again, this is sort of a pressure valve for society too. When there is so much change and problems going on, they can look to this individual and stake all of their frustrations on them. And then, like you said, use the court system through a very satisfying means to feel like they got retaliation. Yeah. Well, and so I was thinking about your class as well. Um, and in your class on witchcraft, I was reading your syllabus that one of your course objectives is to simply acknowledge gender as a historical lens. Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, that seems like it should go without saying, but apparently it needs to be spelled out. Can you speak a little bit about your purposeful inclusion of acknowledging, merely acknowledging gender as a historical lens within your course uh, documents? I think that this is, is, is a really important part. I do think that this can, for, for the majority of my students, this goes without saying. Um, that of course we need to look at history through a gendered perspective, that the ways that men experience in history, the ways that women experience history, the ways that multiple genders experience history is different, right? But I still think that there's a long ways to go in terms of getting intersectionality and gender being one of them accepted as a major lens through which we look at history and approaches to understanding that one's gender identity, one's experiences in a man or woman really did matter based upon how they felt about the past and what they were able to do and not do. Um, something we didn't really talk about is, you know, this is a highly patriarchal society. So much of the witchcraft craze is about upholding standards of patriarchal control. Therefore, the women who are older, unmarried, Perhaps they're actually in charge of a lot of land and they have no male to look after them in that way, become very suspect because it's against the status quo. And so when we look at that, we can better understand the experiences of what's going on because we're considering the gendered elements that are present. Well, and then if a woman is like in charge of a lot of land and she's single and older, a really good way of taking that land from her and dispersing it among other people who probably are men would be to get her out of the way by involving her in some kind of witchcraft accusations. Oh, abs- absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the major issues that happened throughout early modern Europe. Massive property swindling for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so what are the, uh, so now we're, we're talking in 2020, we're talking in a very challenging time period um, with the current, you know, pandemic lockdown and everything. But yeah. what are the enduring legacies of witchcraft in modern society? Like, how do we see this history still around us in certain ways if we're willing to look for it? Yeah, I, I think that there are a couple of, of different examples here. I think one that I'd like to start with is the idea that witchcraft is still present in popular culture. This is one of, I think, the most popular sort of television show themes, movie themes that you could have. I could list off, you know, you have the new remake of of Sabrina on Netflix right now, which actually, if any of the listeners are interested, you can see many of the early modern um, tropes of mm. being a witch presented in that show. I find it quite interesting. They must have had a historical consultant or somebody who took, you know, a class on witchcraft as part of their writing team because there's so many things that continue on there. You know, oh, they that's have, so cool. Yeah, they have amatory masses and they have familiars and they're talking about these things, which I found so interesting when I started watching it. Um, you know, but a lot of times the image of the witch, sometimes it is very very, very negative, right? And nefarious and scary. But other times it's kind of more cheeky. You know, you have the hocus pocus witches Mm, um, that's there. And I I think that it it speaks to sort of a a human desire to to see something different, to have this kind of popular image of the witches is something that is just deeply ingrained in our culture, which is really interesting. The other thing that it does too, is it does give a sense of female you know, power and empowerment. Um, I, I saw this, this necklace one time that said, we are the granddaughters of the witches you could not burn. Mm. Um, that gave women this sense of when they say, oh, I'm a witch, that usually means that they, they feel that they can gain power from that status, that they were a powerful woman, that they can be feared, um, which is not something that women always feel. And that can feel very good to a woman to know that they are in a position of power, that they might be feared by members of their society. Um, And so it does look back to sort of this, this idea of female empowerment. But I think even more largely is that the witchcraft craze is a lesson in mass hysteria, Mm. right? What are some of the, um, the t- like the books or the resources that you that have been really inspiring to you with forming your own knowledge over these topics? Yeah, um, so I, I was very lucky that at the University of Texas at Austin, I got to um, take a number of 
classes with Brian Levac, who is an expert on witchcraft in early modern England and Scotland. And he has a number of wonderful books about the witchcraft craze. He actually has the witchcraft source book, which are primary sources from cases there. So it's a great resource to actually get to look at witchcraft cases. Um, another is Robin Briggs, who has a, a book called Witches and Neighbors. Um, that's also really great to look at. And I think those are kind of two people that, that I'm very inspired by. There's another, um, she's a junior colleague uh, at William & Mary, Mickey Brock, who looks at the history of witchcraft in Scotland, in particular in the later 18th century, that's doing a lot of interesting work there. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Julia Gossard, uh, where can people find you if they would like to, you know, follow up, ask questions, uh, learn more about your your upcoming books? Um, you can also talk about what you are like publishing in the next year. That'd be really cool as well. Yeah. So um, I am currently finishing my book uh, with McGill Queens University Press on um, the history of children and youth in early modern France called Coercing Children, and that'll be out next year. Uh, but for more information on, on my research, I, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter at JM Gossard um, or on my personal website, Julia M. Gossard at or juliamgossard.com. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I would love to uh, have you back on whenever that book is coming out as well and um, talk specifically about that because I know that that's like sort of like your your passion at the moment. Um, so we'll get you back on to talk about the book whenever it's nearing its release date, okay? All right. Sounds good, Greg. Thank you for having me today. Well, Dr. Julia Gossard, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Streibig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening.